Welcome back, Mindsetters. We're with Kathy again. Very exciting. Grade 11s, I know you guys have been amped from the start. I'm Katleha, remember, this is Kathy. We we'll need to get you a, a, like a, step, a pedestal or kay. something. Because really, We're darling, have a step this is week. awful. <laughs> Otherwise, I've got to stand up because I really feel like a like giant tall around you. Oh. Hey, That's okay. Sweet, though. I mean, like, <laughs> gorgeous. Thank you, Kathy. Yes. Thank you. We're doing bacteria today, hey? We're doing bacteria, yeah. Okay, that mm. sounds exciting, guys. I know you guys have your pens and papers ready, and you guys are ready to and pay focus. Attention. Yes, focus focus, focus, focus. Help each other, guys. Remember our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash learn extra, and our Twitter handle is at learn extra. Remember, help each other, ask each other questions. Yeah. I know this is going to be an exciting lesson. And post to us, guys. Just post questions yeah. here if, if there's anything you don't understand while I'm busy teaching it. Don't post things about yeah. um, Christmas time and what you're going to get as a, birth no, a Christmas present that stuff. because uh, ask stuff mm. now. Okay. And ask it very focused, guys. Kathy, do you want to take it away? Yep, let's start. Sure. Okay, bacteria. Now, remember last week we were doing viruses and I said to you, yeah, and these people that get flu and blah, 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 and you feel miserable and you know what all the flu symptoms are. Guess what I did on Monday? I felt like a bus had hit me. My nose was pouring, my throat was sore, my ears couldn't hear, and my head whooshed around. After taking plenty of flu muti, um, which actually just deals with the symptoms and not the causes, what I should have done is slept, which I didn't really do that much of, because I can't sit still. I'm, I don't know, A D D D D D D. Okay, but here I am today. My throat is killing me. Um, my nose is sore. The back of my throat is sore. It looks like I've got tonsillitis, although I don't have tonsils. My ears are like whooshy. My head, every time I do this, goes. Zh, zh. It's, it's like I'm having a party in here for a thousand people with quite a lot of liquid, and, and I'm, I'm not benefiting from it. That's flu. Now, while we had the viruses, I said to you, the bacteria are opportunistic, nasty little things, and they come along. Look, there's some good bacteria, but there's some really awful ones too. They come along, and they're the ones that cause bronchitis and all those other things, those secondary infections that we get when we get flu. So... The problem is we go to the doctor and we say, oh, feeling bad, think I've got flu, temperature, nose running, blah, 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 all the classic flu symptoms, and they say, yes, and they write out a, prescript a, a, a prescription for antibiotics. And hopefully, you'll turn around and say to them, uh, excuse me, being a grade 11 learner and having learnt hard and studied my work, viruses, you, your body produces interferon and we have active and passive immunity. So uh, why are you giving me an antibiotic? Do you have shares in the chemist? And they'll laugh at you and they'll say, no, we're giving it to you not for the flu, but for the opportunistic diseases that follow when the virus hits your body and lowers your immune system. Now, what are those opportunistic, nasty little critters? It's bacteria. And we have good bacteria, but we have some really vile bacteria too. So here we go. Just some background that you must know. I'm not into typing up PowerPoints, and you guys know this. So if I've put it here, it means it's important. So what does that mean? It equals learn well. And here we go. And also, learning is, is one thing, but understanding is another. So first of all, it's the smallest bacteria, smallest living organisms found on Earth. And where do we find them? Well, guess what? In the water, in the soil, in the air, everywhere and all around us. <coughs> the bacteria classified as, now look at this, Prokaryotic, okay? Karyotic has to do with the nucleus of a cell. If they are prokaryotic, it could have been prekaryotic, would have been for me a better term, but it's prokaryotic, it was before the nucleus. So they don't have a proper nucleus, they have what we call a nucleoid, okay? If something has, and here I've explained it, organisms on the five kingdom classification, and I did that with you last week, uh, in fact, two weeks ago. Now, prokaryotic means before the nucleus. Eukaryotic, which is what we are, and pretty much all organisms that are higher than bacteria, we are eukaryotic, which means we have a true nucleus. 
Okay, all they've done is they've swapped the E and the U around for true. So, but this is all Latin, so they didn't really take the English, but it's a way to remember it. So prokaryotic, before the nucleus, eukaryotic, it has a true nucleus. It has a proper nucleus. All right, not all bacteria, and this is very important, people, NB. Not all bacteria are pathogens. Now remember, what is a pathogen? It's a thing that gets into your body and causes disease. It's not a nice thing. It's a baddie. All right, so germs. They are not all pathogens. There are some really good ones, and it's because of the bacteria that we actually have um, your, your traditional beer, like macho and, and the trad proper traditional beer. It's because of bacteria that we have cheese. Okay, and yogurt. Right, now, good bacteria, and that's what I've done. I've written good and bad, so that you don't confuse the two. Good bacteria, well, they form the bottom of all food pyramids. Why? Because they are part of the decomposing process. They decompose. And if we didn't decompose things and break them down to their basic components and give back to the earth, my goodness, can you imagine what this earth would be like? I mean, we would have rotting corpses everywhere. We'd actually have to climb over everything to get to anything. So they are decomposers. And remember, your food, um, let me just quickly remind you of your food pyramids. Your basic food pyramid, what did you have? You had your decomposers. And then you had your producers. which were all things that can photosynthesize, and then you had your three different types of consumers, okay? You had your primary consumers, you had your secondary consumers, and you had your tertiary consumers, and it carries on and on and on as, long as, as big as you want to make the pyramid. Your primary consumers were generally herbivores, your secondary consumers were generally carnivores. And your tertiary consumers would be carnivores and omnivores. Om, omnivores. I suppose you could also add omnivores in here as well. All right, so that's your basic food pyramid. Okay, so going back here. Your good ones are your decomposers, together with um, fungus or fungi and algae, another big con a, a decomposer. All right, your baddies, your baddies, and people who know these diseases. TB, I mean, sure, you know how, how awful TB is. And people have to be on antibiotics for up to six months with tuberculosis, cholera, um, messed up water, and it, the disease is just spread. Um, most of the uh, uh, STDs, most STDs are bacteria. Syphilis, gonorrhea, and all those terrible things, which I'm going to be doing with the grade 12s later on this year. And I will remind you that I am, so you can have a look at some of those STDs. They are revolting. All right, so um, your STDs. Remember, HIV is an STD, sexually transmitted disease, but it's also transmitted in many other ways, but it's a virus. Okay, it's an antiretrovirus. So, antibiotics, where antibiotics did not work on viruses. Why? Your body had to make its own interferon, which interferes with the duplication or reproductive process of the virus. Your bacteria need antibiotics. And the antibiotic must be taken for the period that it's given to you for. So if the doctor gives you an antibiotic, and it's a five-day antibiotic, and you decide after day three, well, I feel fine, I'm not going to take it anymore, if only one bacteria survives, they multiply or duplicate or reproduce by a process very similar to mitosis. And what happens? One becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16, becomes 32, becomes 64, becomes 128. And before you know it, in a couple of hours, you have fully fledged, full of those bacteria again. That's the way they reproduce. So you must take your antibiotics and make sure you kill the very last one of them. 
Okay, antibiotics, please, and I've said it again, do not help with viral infections. Only the interferon does. I don't know why it does this, but clearly this thing, this is a male board. What can I say? Okay, structure of bacteria. People, I'm going to go through this, but I'm going to show it to you on the slides. They are unicellular. What does uni mean? One, remember for, for, for your any biological subject, mono and uni means one. We talk about unifying the country. It means that every single person in it becomes one. Right, so uni, mono, one. Die or buy, two. Try is three. Tet, four. Pent, five. Hex, six. Okay, so single cells, or they can live in colonies, which means they either live in groups or they live on their own, just like human beings. Right then, each bacteria is surrounded by a cell wall, and the cell wall is made of murin. All right, very important. Not like plants, where the cell wall is made of, Cellulose. Here the cell wall is made of a substance called murine. Now, the wall is covered by, and this is important, that slime capsule. And the slime capsule is going to stop, it's around the murine wall, cell wall, and it stops that bacteria from drying out. Whereas, remember, your virus can crystallize. Your bacteria can't. Right? It's, it's got living structures in it. It is a living cell. It's classified in the five kingdom classifications. So what have we got? It's got the slime capsule to protect it, which is because they're slimy little characters anyway, these bacteria. So that's really important, the slime capsule. And it stops it from drying out. I could have put what? What's the word I could have used? Desiccation. Okay, it's such a long word, and it's so difficult to spell. But if you ever get it, know that desiccation means drying out. But if instead of using desiccation, just say dry out. It's easier and you can't misspell it. All right. All cell, the, uh, at least the cell membrane lines the cell wall. But look here. There are no membrane-bound organelles. Now, if you recall, when we started out this year, we did the cell and all the organelles in a cell. And all those organelles had little double membranes around them. So you had the ribosome, you had the nucleus, um, with a nuclear pores between the double membrane. And um, we did the mitochondria with a double membrane. We did chloroplasts with a double membrane. Um, and what they're telling you here is this animal is so basic. It's like the bottom, bottom, bottomist rung. Bottomist? Sure, bad English. Um, it's on the lowest rung of a ladder as you go up in diversity, as you go up in, in organi organization of the organism. So the more complex ones on the top and the one that's right on the bottom, bottom, bottom step, okay, is going to be your bacteria. That's that group of organisms sit right down there. Okay, so they're very basic. They don't have a, a membrane-bound organelles. Just everything just floats around in this cell membrane in the cytoplasm. Okay, many bacteria have flagella. Now, the flagella is like a little tail, and that's to make them move or to help them move so they can get from A to B. Now, remember, they're prokaryotic. They're before the nucleus. They have no nucleus or no proper nucleus. They've got something called a nucleoid. So instead of saying nucleus, it's sort of like the basic version of a nucleus, it's the nucleoid. It's just a whole bunch of, of, of uh, um, DNA that clumps together in a group. Right. Um, we also have small circular pieces of DNA, all right, and they're called plasmids, and they float around in the cytoplasm, and they're also used in genetic engineering. Um, when you get to grade 12, you must know how we produce or how the genetic engineers make insulin. And what they did was they took a plasmid from bacteria, they cut a piece out of the plasmid, all right? They take a piece of the DNA um, in a rat, well, a rat, humans, if they want to make it for humans, the humans that actually produces the, the insulin, they stick it in the plasmid of the bacteria, splice it in, 
and stick it back in the bacteria. And the bacteria then happily makes insulin. And that's the insulin that diabetics will use and inject into their bodies. Okay. Um, here's a diagram. It's a very simple diagram. It's a pretty one, though. Nice colors, which I chose because I wanted to show you the colors. But look at this. We've got this capsule, which is actually your slime, or the, not your, the slime capsule, which surrounds the little bacteria. Then we have the cell wall, which is the yellow layer. Then we have the plasma membrane, which is colored in green over here. So you've literally got the cell membrane, the cell wall, and then the slime capsule, which surrounds it. Um, cytoplasm in the center, so it's not just nothing. There's your cytoplasm here. You've got ribosomes. Now, what, remember, ribosomes were for protein synthesis. Do you remember when we started and I said to you, we're going to do the cell, the animal and the plant cell, and we do the organelles? And this is the grounding-like multiplication tables for the rest of your life science career. If you go and study medicine, if you go and study to be a marine biologist, if you do anything in the medical field or the biological field, you need to know the basics about cells. Okay, do you remember that? All right, and this is exactly what we're doing here now. Ribosomes, cytoplasm, cell wall, cell membrane, etc. You need to know all of this. By the way, plasma membrane and cell membrane are exactly the same thing. Then we've got our plasmids. Now remember, plasmid, just a little bit of DNA that floats around. It's got no membrane around it because there are no membranes, double membranes surrounding any of the organelles. The pilli are just little things that stick out. Okay? On some bacteria and on others, you won't find it. But here it is. Okay? Then you've got the nucleoid. It's like a nucleus, but it isn't because it's not an actual nucleus. It's prokaryotic. It's before the nucleus. So it's just circular DNA that's sort of clumped together is our nucleoid. And then we have the bacterial flagellum, or you can just call it a flagellum. You don't have to call it a bacterial flagellum. Okay, so people, very important. The slime capsule, but look here. It's got a cell wall. And your evolution, people that, that are quite into the whole evolution process, say that this is part of the whole developmental process and the diversity process. It's here we started with, cell, with plants first and then animals evolved from plants. Um, and it, it, remember, these are all theories. No one knows without a doubt. It's all theory. Okay, here we go. Structure of the bacteria. This is a typical bacteria cell. It was just another diagram to give you another idea because remember, your teachers can throw pretty much any diagram at you, especially in an exam. They can take diagrams from anywhere. So it's just to show you a different perspective. So what have we got here? We've got our slime capsule, which is all the way around. We've got the cell wall. We've got the cell membrane. We've got little ribosomes all over. Here are your pili sticking out. Um, and again, they call it a plasma membrane. It's a cell membrane, same thing. Okay, your nucleoid is what's important because that nucleoid contains the DNA. And it's just clumped, that's all. And then you've got your plasmids, which they haven't got on this diagram, but it's very important. The slime capsule and the cell wall and then the cell membrane. Cell membrane, plasma membrane means the same thing. Okay, now, this is exceptionally important, and I need for you to know this. Bacteria that are pathogenic. Now, remember, not all bacteria are pathogens. If they are pathogenic, they're going to make you sick. And on that note, cut. I think we have to go to an ad break. An ad break, eh? Yeah. Are we not heading for one? Yes, definitely we are. Guys, you heard Kathy. ad break time. Welcome back, Grade 11s, to another fantastic show with Kathy on bacteria. Hope you guys got your refreshments and you're ready to roll and you've got your questions as well and your clarifications. I'm so happy to see that you guys are helping each other and pulling through for each other and asking a lot of questions. That's good. It means you're here and you're present with us. Kathy, over to you. 
She's so sweet. I mean, how can you get excited? It's this wonderful, exciting lesson. Another episode of bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we love bacteria. We're <laughs> loving this. We're enjoying okay, it Okay, so people, much. let's get excited about these horrible nasties because the pathogenic bacteria are the ones we have to watch out for. They're the reason why we wash our hands. They're the reason why you should actually wash your hands before you go to the toilet and after you finished. And if you're in a public toilet, make sure that you take some toilet paper and then flush with the toilet paper, not touching your hands, because there are a thousand million germs there. And when you take that same toilet paper and you open the tap with it, wash your hands and then close the tap. Those taps that sort of cut, you know those taps that you sort of yeah, put your hands under and the they sensor. just work? Yeah, yeah the I love those. They're the best. Yeah. Okay. But you still have to walk out of that door. Uh -huh. So wipe your hands dry with another piece of toilet paper. It's going to be like you're collecting paper, <laughs> okay? That you can use. The other one you chuck in the dustbin. That one you use to open the door. And then you stick it in your bag, not on the floor, because no one's going to clean up after you. And when you get home, you throw it away. Okay, so I think that's what yeah, we need to actually do. That's what do. we need to do. That we should is. actually have doors that open that sensor-wise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the, these are the guys. These are the ones that sit on those toilet seats. These are the ones that have that slime capsule to keep them all ready and moist and ready for skin contact and body contact. Okay, these are the ones that cause pink eye. That when your friend, when you were little, had pink eye, you rubbed her eye and put, rubbed it in your eye so you could also stay home from school for three days. Okay, all those things. Mm. Okay, pathogenic and they spread in. Look at this. They spread in the air. They spread in water. They spread in food. They spread on the skin. They spread on cuts, in the skin cuts. They spread with vectors such as flies and also sexual contact. Okay, so... STDs, here we come. All right, and the flies. Fly comes and sits on, on something that's got the bacteria, another bacteria on its little feet. And then it goes, fly, 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 like flies do, because they're not called walks, they're called flies. <laughs> and then they go and they sit on your face. Now you've got those little bacteria sitting here, and you go, and then you go, oh. just now, or you fix your lip gloss and lick your finger, okay? Uh, guess what? Whatever that little fly was sitting on before, the dog poo, the uh, vomit that someone had vomited, whatever, you get, it's all over you now and all into your body. People, be aware and be hygienic. Okay, so here we go. Bacteria divided into four main shapes. This is quite revolting, but anyway, we've got the round coccus. Okay, now look at the word coccus. It's got C's and it's got little O's and it's got more C's. Okay, so round. That's how you'll remember it. Coccus, round. Okay, then you've got rod-shaped bacillus. And all I can think of is, is asterisk and obelix. And you've got these, those, what, do, what are those pyramid-y things that they're, not the pyramid things, that does like round cylinder things. Kim Belinda's my producer, uh, she knows I don't everything. Know. <laughs> um, th th those, those, no man, they're not pillars. Th th this is my producer, people. <laughs> okay, but anyway, so you've got your bacillus, you've got your comma shaped vibrio, vibri vi vibrio, and you've got your spiral shaped spirillia. So if you remember, coccus is round and spirillia are spiraled, then these two aren't too difficult. You've actually only got to remember two. So what I've done is I've got little pickies here, and I'm going to show you. This is st uh, um, strep streptococcus. That's what you get when you get a sore throat, all right? That's what I think I've got. These little buggers came in when I had my flu, all right? Um, there's streptococcus, which is also you get strep throat, so they both cause inner throats. Um, diplococcus, and you've got just your little cocci floating around. But, uh, yeah, so I'm sure cocci, coccus. All right, there they're on their own. Here, dip, remember the D-I means two. So diplococcus, they are grouping together. They're like little couples, quite sweet. Your streptococcus is in your colony, but the colonies are in a sort of a string. And then you've got your strepto, streptococcus, which is just all grouped together and clustered together. You don't have to worry about the different names. All you've got to know is that they have the round shape. Okay, here the rod-shaped bacillus, 
Again, the bacillus here, they're sort of on their own or they make like a little line. Here you've got diplo, means two. Um, this is salmonella. Now you know how they say you must be careful of, of um, eggs. You can't leave eggs for too long because when they start to, to go off, um, they are like receptors for, for salmonella. Is it chicken as well, Kathy? Chicken as well. Um, also onion, by the way. Oh, you know, if really? you... The, you how often people get sick from old um, potato salad. Oh, wow. And they don't the know why. They think it's the mayonnaise or what. No. It's not. It's the onion. Onion oh, yeah. really goes off very quickly. Um, but your, your um, salmonella, you also get from cans that are bumped. And you know when you, when you go to the... Um, Kat, you know when you go and you do groceries yes. and you've got cans and you take these cans and yeah, chuck them, you in chuck your them into your yeah, trolley? And you don't sort of look, are they not perfectly Clean round or not? Right. Oh, so it's yes. And, and if you buy shape. bottles that have got, you know, jars yeah. with lids, yeah. and you take, you know, you've normally got to stick a knife in there and just tip it a little bit and it goes pop. Yeah. If it doesn't go pop, you don't eat then it. Then you don't eat it because that means do it wasn't not eat sealed it properly. Because hey. yeah, it yeah. hasn't been sealed properly. And the first thing it gets in there is oh, this little guy. And these, oh, they look like little spiders there because they've got all those little flagella around them. They are vicious. Promise you now, if you think you have puked enough, it, it's worse than seasickness. <laughs> all right? And then you've got your normal little bacillus all on its own. And then here you've got your streptobacillus. Okay, so also in a little line. So you've got all these various, just remember bacillus, coccus is round, bacillus is a little, um, little sausage shape. You've got your comma shape, which is easy, your vibrio. See how they, they actually look like a, co a, a comma or even little bean seeds. Um, and your spirillia or spiral shape, spirillium, um, they're either on their own or they actually spiral around each other, okay? But also cause huge, horrible illnesses. So people, please be aware. Okay, now, here's the salmonella invading a cultured human cell. So they've taken a human, uh, human cell and they've actually made it sort of survive outside the body. They've cultured it. And they watch how the salmonella attacks. And by doing that, your genetic engineers and your uh, biochemists and, and etc. sit down and your biophysicists sit down and they have a look at what antibodies they can, uh, um, are produced and how we can actually fight this thing. And the salmonella, again, is just, all you need is a good antibiotic and you sort it. Right, penicillin, very, very popular antibiotic. Okay, how do they reproduce? And this is really important. You've got to understand this because for the rest of your lives, you're going to be moms, you're going to be dads, you're going to be grandpas and grandmas, you're going to be uncles and aunts, and you're going to have little kids that are going to end up getting sick, and you're going to have to give them antibiotics and explain to them why, after they feel better, they should not stop the antibiotic. All right, and how to be hygienic and how to wash their hands before they eat or stick their fingers in their mouths. So here we go. When conditions are favorable, in other words, it's good, it's nice, it's really awesome, all right? Bacteria produce asexually. Now think about this. To reproduce asexually is cool because it doesn't need another bacteria to mate with, right? Or to swap anything with. It's happy. It lives on its own. Even if it's in a colony, it doesn't have to rely on any other organism to reproduce. And remember, every, every organism on this planet is here and it wants to ensure that it survives. And how does it do that? By reproducing. Even viruses, it's the only thing they can do is reproduce. All right, so here we go. When conditions are lovely, awesome, Sun is shining, birds are chirping, everything is perfect, enough food, everything is perfect. They're going to reproduce asexually because it's no problem, it's easy. By a process called binary fission. Now, binary fission is actually mitosis. Okay, and what we have there, DNA duplicates, the nucleoid divides into two, moves apart, transverse wall in the middle. I mean, how easy is this? There's no pregnancy. There's no blah, 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 blah. It's just wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Here I go. One, one makes two. End of story. So 
You have this transverse membrane forms, a new cell wall develops, okay? The cells separate, and what do we have? We have two identical cells. Why? Because that nucleoid duplicates itself and it separates. So it's, it's like cloning. It's exactly the same. All right, easy, peasy, sorted, not a problem. And the scary thing is, do you remember earlier I said to you we go from, and you've got to see this, you've actually got to write this out. Use a calculator and do this. You go one makes two. Those two are going to end up making four. Those four make eight, 16, 32, six, uh, 64, 128. Come cut, you've got to help me here. Sure. Um, uh, is six is 256. Now we start really having a problem here. That's 12, that's 10, 11, and 512, and 1024. And so it carries on. And each of these takes like three minutes. So, so they go up to infinity. Th they <laughs> just keep going, boy. They just keep going. And it's not like they figure, well, hang on, we need this thing to survive. We can't sort of kill it. No, 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 no. They here, they're breeding, they're dispersing because we don't look after our germs, and they just go mad. They just take over. So there you go, people. That is disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> it's called a geometric. Come on, you do maths. Geometric growth rate. Yeah. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, blah, 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 blah. Okay, and look at this. You got 20 minutes, pretty much, but they can actually, when conditions are absolutely awesome and they've got everything they need, and depending on what type of bacteria, three minutes a shot. Okay, now, when conditions are unfavorable, so things are not the way this bacteria likes it, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too acidic, it's too alkaline, um, there's not enough food, um, blah, 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 there's too much, much medicine going in. All these unfavorable conditions, it says, uh-oh, I need to protect myself. So it makes this huge, thick cell wall around itself and it forms something called an endospore. So it actually closes itself up, endo, inside, sport. It's got like this thick capsule around it. And it says, that's me. I'm going to chill for a while until conditions are good. And when conditions are good, well, there we go. And this is why we have to um, use temperatures of 120 degrees to sterilize things. They say boil it. You know, when you go to the middle of nowhere, people that like camping, and you go and you're gonna, you can't just drink any water, but if you take the water from some flowing structure like a river or a stream or a whatever, and you take that water and you boil it, they say boil it for 10 to 15 minutes and it must boil. Now to boil, it needs about 110, 100 and t or 100, 110 degrees to actually boil properly, unless you're at the sea level, and I think it's 96. Come, did, you did physical science. I, I, did, I didn't do science. I did, oh, did, I did life science only. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's around about, it's 96 at the coast, at, at sea level. And as you go up, it sort of gets different. But you've got to boil it for about 120, de at 120 degrees for about 10 to 15 minutes to sterilize. Okay. The cells, look at this. This is important. They remain dormant. They just sit there. They're like seeds. You know, you can find a packet of seeds that your granny had out of her garage. You can take that and go plant them, and the seeds grow. So this is what's important. This endospore is this thick cell wall, and it protects everything inside. It protects it from really high temperatures. Um, and remember, cold temperatures, anything that's made of proteins and it become inactive, so it just stays dormant. All right, it's, it's the hot temperatures. And what do we have to do? We've got to boil the living daylights out of it. Okay, or, I mean, clearly you can use antiseptics, but okay, we'll get to that. Right, now, biological importance is, people, you've got to know this. If, if they give you a question on the bacteria, I can tell you now, this is teacher logic, it's examiner logic. What do we want you to know? We want to know whether you understand the bacteria. So firstly, what is the structure? And you get a picture of a bacteria. Label it, all right? 
Um, name the different shapes if you really want to. Um, they can then, and then they will say to you, what's the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic? Um, are all bacteria pathogens? Yes, no, maybe. All right, and then biological importances. Why are they important to us? Okay, the pathogens cause disease, but the good ones, remember I said to you the baddies and the goodies, the good ones are important to us. They actually are very important. So we're going to go to ad break soon, soon, soon. So let me just quickly go through this. First of all, they are saprophytic and decomposers. Remember, they form the base of our, our, our pyramid, our survival pyramid, our food pyramid. Okay, and they decompose all the dead organic matter. So saprophytic, what is a saprophyte? It's something that lives on dead dead organic matter. Let me just write here, lives on. Okay, so it lives on dead organic matter. We don't, we, oh, mind you, I suppose if we eat bread, we're living on dead organic matter too, but th they live on dead organic matter. They help to decompose, to rot um, anything. Bacteria are essential in the production of humus. Humus is that thick, rich stuff that we put fertilizer, um, no, it's not fertilizer, it's, it's what we use to fertilize our soil when you use compost, okay? That rich, rotting, dead leaves and stuff that we now churn into our gardens and we're feeding back to the earth, all right? Bacteria are also very important, and this is incredibly important to us as human beings, in the nitrogen cycle, because if they don't, nitrify or denitrify or fix the nitrogen, we actually cannot make proteins, right? Or the organisms that, that we eat that produce proteins, we won't have any proteins. We need the nitrogen to bond with the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen to make a protein. Cut, it's yours, darling. Guys, yeah, I know you're enjoying this a lot. I know, because I, I am, and you guys are enjoying it as much as I am, so we are both enjoying it. And but are we going to wash our hands? Yes, w wash your hands. Mm. Wash your hands during the break. Make sure that they're clean and tidy and you use all your pieces of tissue. <laughs> Enjoy your break, guys. <laughs> Welcome back, Mindsetters. Hope you guys had a fabulous break and your hands are clean and your tissues are ready and everything because <laughs> Kathy will be looking uh. if you're clean or not so we know how much bacteria you have on your slimy little fingers. Uh, Kathy, over to you. <laughs> that brings me to kissing. Every time you kiss with tongue, okay, does that explain it? Yeah. Oh, I can see <laughs> your face. I'm like, uh. You are swapping about five thousand germs both ways. Five thousand? Mm. Isn't that revolting? That is disgusting. It's almost enough to put one off kissing. Yeah. That's so lucky. Yeah. Mm. Don't kiss me here. Kiss me here. <laughs> yeah, on the cheek. On the and cheek. then be careful to bring a tissue to us. <laughs> oh my gosh, can you imagine? They say, they say that's what Michael Jackson ended up um, as towards sure. the end. He was, he was like absolutely neurotic about, about cleanliness. About cleanliness, yeah. hey? Shame. Oh. Shame. That's a hard life to live as well. I, I think so, yeah. Hey? Very, I mean, everything's oh, rich, yeah. wonderful, happy, lucky, has his own... Yeah, and you can never be too clean, and he knows that as well. So sure, yeah. but you can only sleep in one bed. Yeah. You can only wear one set of clothes. And your you sheets know? must be changed, like, every morning. Oh, no. Jeez, uh. I mean, <laughs> all right, so here we go, people. Bacteria are very important night for the nitrogen cycle. Why? You've got your nitrifying bacteria, which we're going to do just now. You've got your denitrifying bacteria and also nitrogen fixing, and I've just lost my pen. Okay. Then bacteria used to produce butter and yogurt and cheese and mass. And one of the questions that, that Kat got just now was from somebody who asked, how do you tell the difference between um, cheese that's, that's just mature and cheese that's off? Believe me, unless you have a microscope, it'll be very difficult, okay, because you're going to have different types of bacteria. Your bacteria that caused it to form cheese is going to take it to, an, uh, to a second process, but then you've got other bacteria that also join in. It's like leaving your sandwiches in a packet, okay? Take a sandwich and leave it in a packet, 
all right, for a couple of days, but that's fungus. But I mean, when you open it, you've got like 20 different types there, and you think, where, where did this come from? They had to have, because spores must have come from somewhere. Um, so we have pretty much the same with your bacteria. If you've ever taken a mouthful, I was telling Kat just now, um, a mouthful of, of off yogurt, let me tell you something now, that's how you tell. You tell by the, the texture, the taste, and I can and see her smell. laughing. And the smell. And the smell, <laughs> yes, the smell, definitely. All right, so bacteria used to produce butter, yogurt, cheese, and mass. Um, a process of bacteria fermentation uh, um, is to, yeah, a process of bacterial fermentation produces vinegar, all right? Um, we also use bacteria for the rotting of sisal and linen. I mean, you can use any of these biological importances. They're also used for genetic engineering, especially to make insulin, people. Um, I'm going to put here, um, e.g., insulin. And I explained that to you, the splicing on the plasmid. Then um, farmers use bacteria to make the silage. Silage is what, cats, uh, what, what cattle eat. They put it in those big round things on the farm, silos, and they chuck all the bits and pieces of cut plant matter, and they chuck molasses on it. And I remember as a kid eating that molasses. It's awesome. It's like, you know, Wilson toffees, those, those brown ones? The, those are the same as molasses taste. All right, and then doing sewage treatment, because people, if we did not have bacteria to decompose the human sewage that we pump out every day, let me tell you something, we would have a huge problem. All right, so th they break it down. And this also leads to, when we do environment, <coughs> you have eutrophication. And eutrophication is the rotting of, of, of the leaves and the, and the plant and animal life within a pond. And what happens is, as those organisms die, the bacteria just go sugar. They go mad. Why? Because that's their job. They decompose. And as they are decomposing, they're using oxygen. And eventually, there's less oxygen in the water, so more plants and animals die. And, and they then rot more, and you end up with this whole rotting cesspool, basically. That's eutrophication. Um, all right, treatment of, of bacterial infections. I'm just going to give you the basics. Your antibiotics, how do they work? That was one of the other questions that was asked. They basically stop this, the, the bacteria from reproducing. So it disrupts the production of the cell wall, and that causes the bacteria to burst. Or it works by interfering, like interferon for viruses, interfering with the protein production of the bacteria, and it starves the bacteria to death. So it stops growing and it dies. Okay? A full course, please, this is very important, your full course of antibiotics must be taken because if just one of them survives, remember, you have a geometric growth rate. All right, so let's just go back. What do the antibiotics do? All right, they disrupt the production of the cell wall. So that cell wall is thin. Eventually, the contents of the bacteria will burst out, and it's dead. Some antibiotics interfere with the protein production, so it stops. So you either make it burst or... You starve it, and that's how you kill them, right? Or you can boil them, okay, at 120 degrees for a long time. Um, all right, then, the full course of antibiotics, why? Because we have the geometric growth rate. Bacteria may be, now this is the problem, bacteria may become resistant to the antibiotics, and that's what happens when you only take your antibiotic for two days or three days when it's a five-day course, or for five or six days when it's a 10-day course. Because any bacteria that make it through there, some of them are going to be resistant to that antibiotic. So instead of just having a mild antibiotic because you've got a throat infection, um, after your fifth or sixth throat infection in a row because these bacteria are now just going mad and you're not taking all your antibiotics, you have to be put onto a 10-day heavy going type of antibiotic. So, because they become resistant. And when they are resistant, your normal antibiotics won't kill them. And that's what's happened to the TB bacteria. Okay, now, you're brought, and, and I need for you to know the difference between these two. It's something that they can ask you, okay, is the difference between a broad spectrum and a narrow spectrum antibiotic. Now, people, look at the words. Don't say, ah, how can, we're not doctors. How do we know? Why do we have to know this? Because it's good. It's good general knowledge. All right. But broad spectrum means that it's not really specific. It's sort of like taking a shotgun 
and shooting into the dark and hoping that something hits somewhere. Okay, but you sort of hit it in the direction of the baddies that are around. So in the direction of those bacteria in that sort of group. So it, it kills a whole bunch of different antibiotic, uh, uh, um, bacteria. It's broad spectrum. And honestly, if you think about it, if, you sh if you've ever shot with a shotgun or you've watched where they shoot with a shotgun, it leaves a sort of like a, a one and a half, two meter radius that all those little pellets come out in. Okay. Whereas your narrow spectrum antibiotic is when they know exactly what bacteria is attacking you. And generally, it's when, when the broad spectrum didn't work, then they'd say, okay, let's take a, a tissue smear or fluid or whatever, and we'll go and grow the bacteria, which is what they do. And within a couple of hours in the lab of growing this bacteria, they can then suss out what bacteria it is, and what antibiotic to use specifically. And that's when you have a narrow, specific um, antibiotic. Or it shouldn't be specific, it should be a, a narrow spectrum, not specific. A narrow um, spectrum antibiotic, and that is then going to say, right, boy, he, you are now targeted. And that's like a sharpshooter sitting there with a rifle. And they can shoot at 500 meter or a kilometer away, and they can target one single thing with one shot. Okay, so th think of it in these terms. Shotgun and rifle. And that should be your penicillin and streptomycin. Oh, by the way, penicillin, some people are allergic to penicillin. I've got a friend who the other day ate olives that, that were filled with blue cheese. And blue cheese, some types of blue cheese are made from copper wires and others are made from bacteria. And the bacteria that makes that blue cheese is very similar. It belongs to the same family as the bacteria that makes penicillin. And Athelia is so allergic to penicillin. So we didn't know this, so there we are eating these olives. They are delish, eating them. And within 15 minutes, she started to scratch. And she said, oh my gosh, I'm itching everywhere. Um, you know, it, I don't know what it is. And then she took off the T-shirt because she thought maybe it had been washed or something. And she just, the next thing, she had welts all over her body. Mm. And that was a reaction to the, the penicillin, which was in the blue cheese, which was in stuffed olives that we were eating. I mean, how ridiculous is that? So people, people that are allergic to penicillin, it can kill them. And that's why... Um, Kat, have you ever gone to, to hospital with somebody yeah. to like an emergency room yeah. or something? The first thing they say is, are you allergic, are you allergic to, penicillin? to penicillin? That's the first question they ask. Yeah, because it can really cause huge issues. It depends on how allergic you are. Your body can just shut down. So they must know. And if you are allergic to penicillin, then they will give you streptomycin, which is a different form, but it's also an antibiotic. And most of your antibiotics contain penicillin and streptomycin. And geez, we've got so little time. Treatment of bacterial infections. More effective medicines are produced through biotechnology. That's very important. Okay, And that's how they were able to produce the antibiotics. Your bacteria and your fungi produce antibiotics to ensure that they eliminate uh, uh, competition. So you'll have a, a bacteria colony in an area, and they will produce um, antibiotics to kill any bacteria that are around them so that they don't have any competition for what they want. And that we take that and we make the antibiotics. Scientists are awesome. Kat, I think that's about that's it, it, guys. That's yeah, right. if you're going to have to give it a miss today, that's oh really well, we had not a enough time. We had a fantastic show, Kathy. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure, Thank hun. you very much, Grady Levins. I know you guys enjoyed Were there that. any other questions? I remember that we got like... 20 seconds, um, there was one... Oh, you, you went through, you went through them. Yeah, you went through Just them. Just remember, well. people, that your, your, bac your bacteria, your good ones, are saprophytic. All right? They break things down. They are the ones we need for decomposing. They're the ones that make cheese and yogurt. Hmm, nice. Yeah. Yeah. But the baddies... Keep away from them. Wash hands. Wash hands. Don't guys. touch faces. <laughs> Remember to watch out for those flies as well when they sit on you. <laughs> guys, thank you so much for a fantastic show. Remember, practice makes perfect. Learn more and learn extra. See you next time. Bye.